They are amazing, amazing people. I'm going to talk more about Pastor Mondo as the message goes on, just because of the opportunity that we've had to know to get, get to know each other. But I'm so grateful because I believe God has a word for you and for this house specifically. And I'm excited about it because I believe when the Lord has a word for the house that you should receive it and be open to it. And so I pray that you came expecting something great today. I, I don't know where your expectation level is, but I know on the way over here, my expectation level was on an 11 out of 10. Come on now. I'm expecting God to do something here today. Maybe you just came today because um, you knew it was Transition Sunday, or maybe you came to see, are they really turning the church over to Mondo? I can't believe it, right? You wanted to see it, but I'm telling you, my expectation level is through the roof because I believe that God wants to speak to us today and that he has a word for us. And so my prayer is that you receive it today, and my prayer is that you are excited about what the Lord has done. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray just for a few moments, and I don't know where your expectation level is, but I'm going to pray as I pray that it will begin to rise and that your faith will begin to rise to a place where you're saying, you know what, God, I want to receive what you have for me. Can somebody say amen? amen. So I'm going to pray. So, Lord, I pray right now. Will you lift your hands if you, if you don't mind? Just If you just feel comfortable, just lift your hands right where you are. God, I pray for every person in this room. God, I don't know why you brought them here, but God, you brought them here because you have a word for them. And God, I pray, Father, that you would speak to them. Speak to me, God. Speak through me to your people. God, I pray that your, our expectation level will begin to rise and that, God, we would say, God, we want whatever you have for us today. For some, it may be healing. God, for some, it may be a word. God, for some, it may be deliverance. I don't know what it is, but, God, you have something for them today. And so, God, we receive it by, your, by faith today, God, and we thank you for it in advance, in Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen, amen. Hey, the title of my message today is Taking the City. Taking the City. Somebody say, take the city. Taking the city. You know, one of the things that I've realized about God is that anytime he wants to do anything significant in the earth, first he needs a person, and then he needs a people. He needs a person, and then he needs a people. As you look throughout the scriptures, you begin to find that the Lord, for some reason, he picks a person, not a people first. He picks a person first, then a people. As I read throughout the scriptures, and even the beginning of the year, we go through our reading plan, and as I begin to notice that if he wanted to save the earth, he used Noah and then his family. He called Noah first and then his family and then he also called Abraham, and then he called his family to be a part of it. And, and as you watch, you see David, and you see Daniel, and you see all these different ones, Moses, how the Lord uses a person and then a people. And as I was beginning to study and begin to prepare for today, I began to look at, at in Nehemiah because that's where the Lord has been leading, and we've been reading through this. And so I began to look in the book of Nehemiah, and I begin to study how, how Nehemiah rebuilt the wall around Jerusalem. But before you can do that, before we can get into that text, we have to go back and get a little bit of context and begin to understand what happened before he got to build a wall. And which brings me back to the place of a guy named Zerubbabel. Somebody say Zerubbabel. Yeah, say that three times, right? Zerubbabel, okay. There was a guy named Zerubbabel. And Zerubbabel was a gentleman who, who, was, who was commissioned and charged by King Cyrus to go before the wall was built. Jerusalem was tore down. They had been exiled by the Babylons. And so they were away. And King Cyrus told Zerubbabel, I want you to go back and build the temple of God. He picked a person. And Zerubbabel went and did that. He went and began to build the temple of God and began to first build the altar and then the temple. I feel like this is significant before we can ever get to Nehemiah, which that's going to be my text. If you're wondering where I'm going to preach from, I'm preaching from Nehemiah. But we got to start at Zerubbabel because Zerubbabel was the one who built the altar and the temple. Before the walls could ever be built, the temple had to be built. And what the temple and the altar represents 
It's prayer. The Bible says that now that Jesus has come, we are the temple of God. And, and we are the ones who have to be make sure that our temples are clean and rebuilt. And it's important for us to understand that the temple represents prayer. Represents prayer. And the temple is a place where we offer up incense, incense to the Lord. And so, as I begin to think about it, I begin to think, you know what? It was important. Before they could ever rebuild the wall, they had to rebuild the temple. They had to rebuild the temple in order to get prayer going like it should. And as I begin to think about where we are at today, before we ever rebuild the wall around the city of San Antonio and get the church where it needs to be, prayer is where it all starts. Somebody say amen. And that's why I thank God. I thank God for sending Pastor Armando and Pastor Ramona to this city 33 years ago where they begin to realize, you know what, the first thing that we have to do is that we have to rebuild the altar and rebuild the temple. And as I was praying, the Lord spoke to me and said, you know what, what they represent is Zerubbabel. They represent the person who came and rebuilt the temple and started prayer like it should be in this area. And I believe that it's not only started, but it's going to continue. Can somebody say amen? I love it. 75 years later, Ezra came and began to read the word of God. The Bible says he began to read the Torah. And so the first thing that we realize in, with Zerubbabel is that you have to start rebuilding with prayer. The second thing that you have to understand is that you have to start to rebuild with the word of God. Ezra began to read the Torah, and the Bible says that the people responded to him and even began to throw a festival because of him reading the word of God. Why is it important to preach the word of God and the uncompromised word of God? Because the word of God represents truth. Somebody say truth. It represents truth. And we need the truth and the word of God in this day more than we've ever needed before. We need the truth more than we've ever needed it before. Why? It's because people have come up with their own truth. Right? A lot of people have decided they're going to determine what truth is. And so many times we're confused because we don't know what the truth really is. And that's the reason why preaching the word of God, the uncompromised word of God, is important because it represents truth. This is what I want you to understand, is that people's thoughts and truths, humanity's thoughts and truths, are really just their perspectives. It's just their perspectives. This is what they think it is. The word of God is not perspective, it's objective. And it's not subjective, it's objective. It is the word of God, it is the truth, and we have to stand by it. That's the reason why when people come to me and start saying, hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about at this issue and that at issue? What I say is, you know what? I think whatever the word of God says. Because this is the truth, and this is how I build my family. This is how I build my finances. This is how I build everything on is the word of God, because this is what the truth is. Can somebody say amen? amen? So it was important that Zerubbabel built the temple, and God, that was the first phase. The second phase was that, that the, the truth and the word of God was there, and now we get to Nehemiah, who's going to rebuild the wall. And I really begin to think about this, and this is what the Lord spoke to me. He said that Pastor Armando Sr. represented Zerubbabel, but Pastor Armando Jr. is going to represent Nehemiah. Catch this. Pastor Armando Sr. Rep represented Zerubbabel. He started this thing with prayer. He built the temple. He built the altar. But what God is going to do with Pastor Mondo Jr. is that he's going to use him to build the wall around the city. Come on, somebody better catch that right there. That, that's something I want you to understand. I'm going to say it one more time, that God has used Pastor Armando and Pastor Ramona to, re, to start the temple and to start in prayer because you can't do anything. Prayer is the foundation. This is the foundation. And for 32, 33 years, there's been foundation laid. Why? So now the wall can start to be built. And so this transition is not something that's happening because you go, well, this is just what happened. No, this is a spiritual thing that's happening because now God is putting a man in place that's going to rebuild the wall around Jerusalem. 
And as I begin to explain to you what the wall represents, I think some of you are going to start getting excited about it because you're going to start to realize, oh, we're in wall building phase now. We're in a place where we're going to start to impact not only our local area, but the entire city and maybe even the nation. Can somebody say amen? <laughs> Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1. I hope you have your Bibles. If you don't, we'll put it on the screen. If you don't bring your Bible to church, I encourage you to do that. It's always good for you. Bring your Bible is always a good thing. Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 1 says, In late autumn, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign, I was at the fortress of Susa. Hananiah, one of my brothers, came to visit me with some other brothers who had just arrived from Judah. I asked them about the Jews who had returned there from captivity and about how things were going in Jerusalem. They said to me, things are not going well for those who returned to the providence of Judah. They're in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down, and the gates have been destroyed by fire. When I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days, I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heavens of heaven. You know, when I think about the story, he says, man, how are things going? They say things are not going well. And you know, when I think about our country and I think about all I got to do is turn on the news for 15 minutes and I watch things are going crazy all around our nation. It seems like Abortion rates and suicide rates and murders and all sorts of things are higher than they've ever been before. And as I begin to think about this, I begin to realize that the same thing that's happening in my city is the same thing that's happening in other cities and the same thing that's happening in San Antonio. And part of the reason why these things are happening is because the walls of the city is down. The church, which represents the wall of the city, It's not at the place, the capital C church. It's not at the place and at the forefront that it needs to be. And I believe God is is, is petitioning us and asking us to rebuild the wall of the church because I believe this, that the local church is the answer to the world's problems. Can somebody say amen better than that? I know that many of us are looking at government to solve the world's problems, but the government can't solve the world's problems. Only the local church can solve the the world's problems. It's us. We're the ones who can help people who've been been addicted to get set free and delivered. We're the ones who can solve hunger and all of these things. The local church are the the ones who can do it. But we've got to rebuild the wall. So as I was preparing, I started thinking about God. When we're talking about walls here, let me think about the most famous walls that have ever been rebuilt. Or built, period. And the first wall I thought about was the wall, the Great Wall of China. Anybody know about the Great Wall of China? Yeah? yeah. Oh, that, there's a picture of it right there. And I began to think about it, and I was like, man, that wall was built over 200 centuries. And do you know over 1 million people died building that wall? 1 million people. It's 13,170 one miles long. Anybody been to the wall of China in this room? Anybody? Yeah, me either. I've never seen it. I've only seen pictures. But it's a pretty big wall. The second wall I thought about was the, 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 the Berlin Wall. This is another famous wall. I typed in the most famous walls. The Berlin Wall was built in 1961. There's a picture of it right there. It stopped the Soviets from coming into Germany, and and it was torn down in 1989. I actually remember that. I'm old enough to remember that. I know some of you going, 1989, Lord, how old are you? But I remember that. Many of us in this room, because I'm not the oldest person in this room, you remember that. You remember when that wall came down. 
And I'm like, wow. Anybody ever been to the Berlin Wall? Yeah, no? Okay, awesome. A few people have been there. I've never been. Then I said, okay, what's the number three biggest wall? And I saw Wall Street. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, this is the financial district of New York. I've actually been to that wall, all right? Walked on that street and been like, wow, this is cool. Didn't really impress me, but I thought it was cool, right? Put my hand on the bull and all the cool things, right? Then I finally found the most famous wall of them all, the most famous one. And it was Walmart. <laughs> Some of you didn't know I was going there, did you? Come on, we all, anybody have ever been to Walmart before? Yeah, just a, okay, yeah. Some of you are like, now I'm a Target guy. <laughs> but no, when we talk about walls, I begin to think about what the, what's important about the wall. Well, the wall represents the capital C church. And it represents the church, and what the enemy has done is he has come in to tear the walls down. How has he done that? He's done that through purity. He's done that through the lack of prayer. He's done that through the lack of unity. We have churches fighting against each other. We have churches that are not praying like they used to. We have churches that are not pure like they used to be. And the enemy has come to tear these walls down. And it's important for us to understand that is because when, 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 the, when the, those walls are down, the city is exposed. And that is how the enemy comes in. You know, I found it funny that in 1962, I wasn't alive then. In 1962, prayer was removed from schools. Okay? Now, my parents can tell you they remembered when they used to pray in first hour before school started. But prayer was removed from schools. And Bible reading was removed in 1963. Now listen to me, over the last 58 years, school shootings, drug addiction, are higher than they've ever been. And this is the reason why, because when the walls come down, when the walls come down, it allows the enemy to come in. You know what walls represent? It keeps the enemy from being able to come in. It keeps the good things in and it keeps the bad things out. And what the enemy has constantly tried to do is bring the church down. Try to bring those walls down to allow the enemy to come in and run rapid. But I don't know about you, but we are still one nation under God. I don't care what anybody else says, we're still one nation that's under God. And I'm telling you, if we're going to do anything, we're going to keep the walls of the church back up. Can somebody say amen? amen. This is another thing that I understood was this. Was that when the wall comes down, the enemy uses all sorts of things to pull it down. The enemy will try to come in and divide the church more than anything ever. I watched in 2020. I watched how the church, I'm not talking about just the nation, I'm talking about the church alone, the capital C church, your church, my church, were divided more than they've ever been before. You watch the political issues that took place. The church that I come from, Bethany Church is a large church, and we have both Democrats and Republicans in our church. And I watched how church members were feuding on Facebook. And on Instagram. I watched how the racial tension began to build. Because we come from a multi-generational and multi-ethnic church at our church. And I watched people who used to love each other are now looking at each other differently. I'm not talking about in the world. I'm talking about in the church. I watched how when the finances and things begin to come in, and, and people begin to deal with the recession, how people begin to look at people differently and, and start to deal with things a little bit different. Why? Because what the enemy tries to do is he tries to tear the walls down 
in the church. Because what he's after, listen to me, he's after our unity. He's after our unity. Because let me tell you something. If we can ever get focused and get excited and get on one accord, let me tell you something. When the believers get on one accord, nothing is impossible for those who are on one accord. When we get focused and start to say, you know what, we're going after the enemy. And we're not going to be all divided among ourselves. We're going to put our focus on the right people. I'm telling you, that's when we win. You never win fighting against yourselves. Can you hear what I'm saying? You're always going to lose when you all, there's infighting going on. But when there's focus and unity and the walls are rebuilt, we can win. So let's look at Nehemiah. Nehemiah, this story that we were talking about, the Bible says that he was saddened and burdened. He goes to the king and requests to leave and go back and build a wall. The king grants his request and sends letters of passage. And he, I love what he says in what he says in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 8. He says, And the king granted these requests because the gracious hand of the Lord was upon me. I love the reason why the king granted his request. It's because the favor of God was on his life. Let me stop here before I move on. But I want to say something that's going to move forward as Pastor Mondo begins to rebuild the walls of this church. There's a favor of God that's going to rest upon his life. And I'm not saying this to be churchy. I'm not saying this to be um, whatever. I'm saying it because I feel like the Lord is saying there's a favor that's going to come up on your life. And what that favor is going to do is that their favor is going to cause God to open up doors that shouldn't be open. What that favor is going to do is that you're going to start saying, God, I don't even understand how we got the money to do this, but God, you blessed us with it to be able to move this thing forward, not because it's for your own glory, but it's for God's glory. And I believe there's a favor that's going to be on your life that as this church begins to grow and as this church begins to move forward, you're going to see the favor and the hand of God on your life. And look, let me just tell you something. Everybody's not going to be excited about it. Everybody's not going to be pumped about it. Just like the Bible talked about Sam Ballin and Tobiah throwing hating things at him, everybody's not going to be excited about it. It's not going to matter because the favor of God is going to rest on your life. And listen, when the favor of God is on your life, you just move forward with it. I heard T.D. Jake said, favor ain't fair, and it's not fair. I have been in ministry for many years, and I've watched the favor of God rest up on my life in many areas. And you know what? It's not fair, but it's okay because it's the favor of God. And they don't know all the things that you've gone through. They don't know the prayers that you've prayed. But just understand, walk in the favor of God and just know that it's there. And don't worry about what everybody else says about you. Can somebody say amen? Come on, y'all ought to shout because the favor of God is going to be on your pastor. That kind of stuff makes us feel weird because we go, well, I don't like the spotlight being on me. And I don't either. But you know what? When God's hand is on your life, there's nothing you can do about it. David, when they anointed the king of Israel, David didn't even come to the party. They brought in all of David's brothers to be anointed, and David was out in the field. But can I just tell you something? Because the favor of God was on David, they had to go out and get David from the field so they can bring him in and anoint him. Why? Because it was on him, and it wasn't on anybody else. And Samuel could not pour that oil on anybody else besides the one that God spoke to. And I'm excited today because I feel that there is something that's moving forward in this church. God is doing something in this church. But this is what the Lord spoke to me about this. He said that when the favor comes upon a leader, it's not just on that leader. Because the Bible says that the anointing flows from the head down to the beard to the skirts. And everything that's attached to that leader, now this is where you ought to get excited because I'm getting excited. Everything that's attached to that leader receives that as well. 
So that means if the favor of God is on Pastor Mondo, that means that the favor of God is on you. Oh, come on now. I wish I had two people who received that by faith. That if the favor of God is on the leader of this church, that means the favor of God is on this church. Everything that's attached to it. That means that if God is blessing him, that means that God is blessing you. If you can just stay faithful, if you can just stay submitted and stay a part of what God is doing here, that means that anointing is flowing from the head down. That's the reason why I can pray for favor and vision on my pastor. Because I want him, my pastor to be blessed. See, some people are like, well, I don't, you know, I don't, they always drive. No, I want my pastor to be blessed. Why? Because if my pastor is blessed, guess what? <laughs> that anointing is flowing all the way down, and I'm going to be blessed. If he's got vision, that means I have vision. I want his family to be blessed, because that means my family is going to be blessed. And you got to understand that this is not just a one-person thing. It's a people thing. And this is what I want to give to you real quick. Three points, and I'm going to sit down. Three points. The first thing that has to happen in order to rebuild a wall is that we have to share the burden. Nehemiah 2.18. Then I told him about the gracious hand of God that was upon me and about the conversation I had with the king. And listen to what it, what it says. Look at that. They replied at once, yes, let's rebuild the wall. So they began the good work. Yes, let's rebuild the wall so they, not him, alone, they began the good work. The wall of the city is not going to be built by one man. It's going to be built by all of us. It's going to be built by all of us. What has to happen is, is that we have to share the burden. The Bible says that Nehemiah fasted and prayed and wept because the walls were down. There was a burden for him to see the walls rebuilt. And in order for us to see God do something here significant in San Antonio, every one of us in this room, and that's watching this later on, maybe you're at home watching online, every one of us, we have to get a burden for this city. Look, we can't just say, well, man, well, good, I like just coming to church. Look, that's great. Coming to church is awesome. I like coming to church too. But look, I'm not coming to church just because I don't, have, I don't have anything else to do on Sunday. I could be watching the game. I'm coming to church because I have a burden. Because I want to see God do something. I want to see the kingdom of God advanced. And my prayer for every one of us in here today is that God gives you a burden. Give me a burden for what, Pastor? I don't know. Whatever it is that he wants to give you a burden for. For some, it's going to be a burden for ladies. There's going to be some ladies in this room that you're going to have a burden to see some ladies set free and delivered. Maybe you were depressed and God brought you out of it. And maybe you need to say, hey, God has given me a burden. I need to go and reach some ladies. Maybe it's for men. Maybe it's for young people. I don't know. But you need to ask God, God, give me a burden. A burden that messes with me at night. God, give me a burden where I can barely sleep sometimes. God, give me a burden for a high school, for a junior high. Can I tell you, for years, God gave me a burden for high schools. Pastor Mondo, Pastor Stephen, Pastor Josh could all tell you, when they came to Baton Rouge, that was what was burning on the inside of me. And that burden was there, and I could barely sleep because I knew there was 105 high schools and middle schools in our area. And even though we were in 50 of them, I was thinking about the 55 that we were not in. And we were reaching 5,700 kids every week. But I was thinking about the tens of thousands that were, and we were not reaching. Why? Because there was a burden that's there. So, Pastor, what's your burden now? My burden now is for us to reach our area and even reach the world. And when I talk to my pastor, all I think about is expansion and growing and how can we get more campuses and how can we go international and how can we build and take what God is doing to other places. That's my burden. 
What is your burden? We all have to share in this burden. I believe God has given Pastor Mondo a burden, but we all have to share in that burden. Can somebody say amen? You know, I played on teams, sports teams, and I played on winning teams, and I played on losing teams. I'm talking about teams who have won championships. Then I played on teams that didn't win a game all season. Come on. I'm going to tell you one of the most recent ones I played on. was this softball team. And this was probably a couple, uh, three years ago or so. A bunch of us, we all wanted to play softball. We all remember from playing baseball back in the day. We all, you know how it is. I still got it, right? So we all got out there. And we were the worst team out there. And it was okay because we get out there, we lose 17 nothing. it's all good. Well, one of the last games of the season, my wife decided to come to the game. And I thought, oh, Lord, please, no. I don't want my wife to see us lose. And so I saw her walking in. I was playing in the outfield, and I saw her walk in. And she was about 10 minutes late. And I saw her ask somebody, what's the score? And somebody was like, yeah, they're down 12 nothing." And she had only been, she was only 10 minutes late. And we ended up losing that game by like, I don't know, 21 nothing, whatever it was. And I was like, my goodness. It was so embarrassing. But the reason why is because, you know what? We didn't really care about winning. Some of us cared, some of us didn't. Some of us just wanted to be out there for the exercise. We didn't have a burden to win. And I'm telling you, if you're going to win in this city, Everybody in this room has to say, you know what, we got a burden to see God do something in our church. We want to see people saved and delivered. We're not just coming to church. We want to see something happen in our city. Can somebody say amen? The second thing is that we have to share in the building. Nehemiah chapter 3 verse 1 says, Then Elijah, Elijah, the high priest and the other priest started to rebuild the sheep gate. They dedicated it and set up the doors, building the wall as far as the tower of the hundred, which they dedicated, and the tower of Hananel. People from the town of Jericho worked next to them, <clears throat> and beyond them was Zachor, son of Emery. The fish gate was built by the son of Hassaniah. They laid the beams, the beams set up its doors, and installed its bolts and bars. Miramoth, the son of Uriah, was with Meshulam, the son, I'm sorry, I messed up. They laid the beam, set up, and the grandson of Hakaz repaired the next, the next section of the wall. Now, I know Hakaz was black because nobody in the Bible <laughs> named Hakaz could have been anything else but black. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. Hakaz, can you break down? Come on. He repaired the next section of the wall. Besides him, besides him were Meshulam, the son of Berechai, the son of whatever his last name was, and then Zadok, the son of Bena. Now, what I love about the whole situation is that you had one family over here building this. You had another family over here building this. These people were putting up the walls and the beams. These people were over here nailing the doors together. Why? Because they all shared in the building. Not only did they have a burden, but then they all shared in the building, which meant that every family was a part of it. And when the wall was finally rebuilt, it wasn't only because of Nehemiah, it was because every family was a part of it. Catch this, everybody. If God is going to do something significant here in San Antonio through House of Prayer, every family in this church has to say, you know what, I'm going to play my part. I'm going to share in the building. It's not an Andrade thing. No, it's an us thing. We're going to share in the building. We're going to be the ones that's going to build this thing together. And you know what, I may have not built the whole wall, but I built this little section right here. This little part right here, oh, this is brown right here. This is us. 
And I'm telling you, God wants to use you to build a section of the wall. Share in the building. Be a part of it. Because when we all share, we can all see it work. I was in the band. And I played in the band. I played drums. And you have in the concert band, you have tubas and flutes and drums and, and all the different things. And if everybody plays their part, it sounds beautiful. It sounds beautiful. But when people start playing different things, it doesn't sound right. If the drums is trying to play the melody, it doesn't sound right because they weren't made to play the melody. Right? If everybody starts doing things out of order, it doesn't work. But we all have to share in the building like we should. You guys catching what I'm saying? God wants to use his church to do something amazing. We all have to be a part of it. I'm grateful that I get an opportunity to play a small part. Because I believe God's going to do something great in this house. And I'm telling you one thing, C.C. Brown and Wayne Brown and Evan Brown, we're going to play our part to see it happen. Can somebody say amen? amen. Finally, I know you're tired of hearing me talk, and I'm going, to, I'm going to close. In Nehemiah 4, verse 1, it says that, Neo, that Sam Ballard was very angry when he, when he learned that we were rebuilding the wall. He flew into a rage and mocked the Jews, saying in front of his friends and the Samaritan army officers, what does this bunch of poor, feeble Jews think they're doing? Do they think they can build the wall in a single day just by offering a few sacrifices, just because they pray a little bit? Do they actually think they can make something happen? Something of stones from a rubbish of heat and charred ones at that? Tobiah, the Ammonite, who was standing beside him, remarked, that stone wall would collapse, collapse even if a fox walked along the top of it. Hmm. This is one of the things I understand about building walls and building the church, that we have to share in the burden, we have to share in the building, but we also have to share in the battle. Write that down. We have to share in the battle. Why? Because you're never going to build anything great without opposition. If you think that the enemy is not going to come after you, you're deceived. Because if you're starting to do anything significant, he's going to come after you. There's going to be a Sam Bala and a Tobiah that's going to say, what are they doing over there at House of Prayer? What are they doing? They're doing youth services and having prayer meetings and they're fasting and praying and doing outreaches. What are they doing over there? And let me just tell you something. You're going to have to be willing to fight the enemy. I'm not talking about physical fight. I know some of you, you're used to that kind of fighting. No, I'm talking about you have to be able to fight in the spirit. Can I tell you, man, over the last several years at our church, God has done some amazing things. Bethany is a church of 60 years. But can I, can I tell you this? Bethany didn't last for 60 years without a fight. There's been a fight. A fight in the spirit. In 2020, we fought. In 2021, I remember Pastor Jonathan and I said at the end of 2021, it was like, my God, 2021 was a fight. But you know what? We're still here. And we're still rolling. People are still getting saved and baptized and delivered. Why? Because we're willing to share in the battle and say, you know what? What we're going to do is that we're going to build with one hand and have a sword in the other, and we're going to fight. And if House of Prayer is going to do something great for God, which it has for 33 years, but if it's going to continue to do something great for God, you're going to have to build with one hand and fight with the other one. Come on, if you're not ready to fight, you better go ahead and get out the game right now because the enemy's going to throw stuff at us. He's going to throw stuff at your family. He's going to throw stuff at you, and you've got to be ready to fight. And this is what the Lord told me. He says, you're going to have to be ambidextrous in the spirit. What you're going to be able to have to be able to do as much with your right hand as you can with your left. You're going to have to be able to build people and see people's lives change and build them up over here and be fighting off the devil with, the, with your other hand. 
Come on, my wife and I can tell you. Oh, my gosh, we've been in ministry for years. And we've had to build. And we've seen people build. But, oh, my gosh, the fights that we've had to fight. The things that we've had to fight in our minds. The things that we've had to, buy, to fight even in our bodies. Can I just tell you, it was a fight just getting here. Today. My whole family's been sick for almost two weeks. The enemy didn't want me to come here and preach this word. But I said, oh, devil, you're going to have to kill me before, before you take me out. Because I'm telling you, I'm coming preaching this word right here. I'm going to fight with one hand and I'm going to build with the other. It takes a whole lot to take somebody out. And I pray for you. I pray that there's a fight on the inside of you. That the first time the enemy throws something at you, you're not willing to give up. The first time somebody says something bad about house of prayer, that you're not willing to give up and run away. That you're able to say, you know what, no, we're going to fight. We're going to fight. We're going to dig our heels in. And we're going to build this church. And we're going to see the walls rebuilt. And we're going to see lives changed. And we're going to see people's lives delivered. We're going to see people turn their lives around. We're going to see families blessed. We're going to see the favor of God come upon not only us, but our children and our children's children. We're going to see this city changed in Jesus' name. And I'm fired up about it. And forgive me for getting all excited because I'm telling you, when I think about what God is going to do in this house, it fires me up. But we've got to share in the burden. We have to share in the building. And we have to share in the battle. If we do that, you will rebuild the wall. Can somebody say amen?